Hi there. Welcome to Smithville Baptist Church. We're located in Smithville, New York. Easiest way to find us is to come right downtown Smithville, locate the fire department, and we're right around the corner. We've made a lot of renovations at Smithville. We've updated our sound system, our computer system, and video system. We've also renovated our kitchen area downstairs. Uh, we have a beautiful kitchen where we have fellowships every Sunday morning after church. And we've added on a beautiful fellowship hall in the back where we have our big church dinners and we have wedding receptions, baby showers, whatever is needed. Uh, church service is on Sunday mornings at 10 a.m. and we have Bible study, both men's and women's Bible study at 8.30 in the morning. Why don't you come down and join us? So let's pray. Father God, I thank you. I thank you, Lord God, for being in this place today. I thank you, Lord God, for feeling your presence, for, for seeing your hand move, for, for doing things that in our normal uh, natural life we couldn't possibly recognize or, or be a part of. But Lord God, because of the life that you've given us and, and the, the gift of the Holy Spirit in us, Lord, we can see some wonderful things. And I thank you for that, Lord God. I know that you're ministering to people today. I pray, God, that you would continue to do that as I share your word. I pray, God, that you would anoint my lips that I would be able to share your words from your heart into the hearts and lives of, our, of the people that are in this place today. And those that are watching it on film, Lord God, I pray that the or video, let them get something from this as well. In Jesus' name. We just finished up... Uh, the first part of chapter 10 where we were talking about Jesus said he was a good shepherd and I love the fact that he said I have come that they have, may have life that they may have it more abundantly but uh, it caused a division as it always did wherever Jesus went there were those that believed him there were those that trusted him and there were those that don't believe for whatever happens in their whatever's going on in their life they just can't believe one of the saddest stories we actually find is uh, in this section of scripture is that the, the Pharisees and the scribes just could never get it. They just couldn't get it. They were so prideful, so full of religion and regulations and rules that they could not see light in front of them. They couldn't see the light for the darkness that was in their heart. And, it, and it's a sadness And Jesus uh, spoke to them over and over and over and over and over. And the reason he did that was because he loved them. He wanted them to find him, to understand who he was. And, and we find again another section of scripture here, in the, starting with verse 22, where he gets to talk with them again. So here we are, verse 22, it says, Now at the, it, at, it is the feast, excuse me, and get started here. Now it was the feast of dedication in Jerusalem, and it was winter. Now we're, we're basically at about a couple of months removed from where they were last week when I'm talking. Okay, it's a couple of months removed. Uh, it's now winter time. This is Hanukkah. This is basically the feast of dedication. It was interesting. There was a Syrian back in, in uh, 167 BC called in Antiochus Epiphanes. And he was the one that came through, they actually had a battle going on with Egypt. And he kept coming through Judah, Judah and he finally decided, from what I understand reading it, that he, as long as I'm going through here, I might as well destroy them too. So he actually came into Jerusalem and he destroyed the, the country. They took them over and at the peak of their conquest of Jerusalem, they went into the temple and he desecrated the temple. He defiled the temple by cutting up a, a, a pig and splayed his blood all over the temple. Which, if you know by Jewish law, pigs were not, they were uh, not good. And so they did this. Well, what happened was Maccabees, I can't think of the guy's first name, but they haven't got it written down. Oh, yeah, Judas, Maccabees. The Maccabee brothers, actually, he was a few of them. But they went in there and they got a, a started a revolt. And they were able to take back Jerusalem. They were able to take back Judah. And they were able to take back their temple. And so when they had done that, they went in and cleaned the temple. 
And when they had cleaned the temple from one end to the other, they had a time of dedication. Now, this is not a God-ordained feast. It was a man-ordained feast because they already had the dedication of the temple many years back. But because of what had happened, they felt it necessary. It is actually a feast of the rededication of the temple. And it's kind of interesting that that, that took place. So here, here's, uh, that was free, by the way. Um, so here it was, it was winter and Jesus walked in the temple in Solomon's porch. And I just want to make a quick mention of Solomon's porch because you'll find Solomon's porch is very important. A lot of half things happen in Solomon's porch. And it makes you wonder, this is uh, about four months removed from the time that Jesus is crucified. And Jesus knows this, okay? It's not doesn't come as a shock in the middle of the night that, oh my gosh, tomorrow I get crucified. The Father has laid out the plan with him. He knows what's going on, and he's there in the temple. And I think that just like we do when we have uh, special things or whatever, I'm thinking he's walked around, and I bet you he's talking to his Father. And he's foreseeing the things that are going to take place. Like one of the things that take place, I believe, in this area was when Peter and John actually healed the man, the, the lame man, and he jumped up and walked. That was one of the things that took place. There was uh, other things that happened in this uh, part of the temple. But here, he, here's Jesus walking around in the temple. And of course, the Jews, making, that's considered the leadership, the Pharisees, surrounded him. So here we are. They tried to stone him two months ago. Uh, they, they, he kind of got away from them. Uh, just by walking. And here they are back again surrounding him. And immediately they attack him with a question. And it said, they said to him, How long do you keep us in doubt? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Kind of reminds me of having a kid and you've told him something and then you have to tell him again and then you have to tell him again and then you have to tell him again and they don't get it. That's what these, these leaders, they, they were like that. Because Jesus answered and said, I told you, and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. He's reiterating just what he said in previous chapter. He's reiterating everything. The works that I do. Look at, folks, what, what he's trying to tell them is, look at, I have healed the sick. I have removed leprosy from the lepers. I have raised the dead. I have caused the blind to see. I have unstopped the deaf ears. I have done these things. I have provided meals for 15,000 people at one time. What is it that you don't recognize here? No one has ever done this. No one. And yet, the Pharisees cannot see it. They're so hard-hearted. All they could see is he spit on clay and made clay. And that was two rules he broke by spitting and by making clay on the Sabbath day. He, he couldn't, they couldn't care less about the guy got uh, his sight restored that he never had his whole life. And see, and it was, it's that blindness. Folks, it's a, prevalent, it's a prevalent thing in our world today. There's no difference. Because the Pharisees are no different than you and I. I think I've mentioned this more than once. But people outside the building here that have never accepted Jesus and have heard these things and they don't accept them, it's because of their hard-heartedness. They don't see. And unfortunately, there are always going to be those that will not see. They are more interested in self than they are in what's going on. They, they don't understand that they, they have put themselves on the throne that Jesus formed in our, all of our bodies for him to be sitting on. Remember, it's always been said that there's always a, 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 a vacancy in our heart and it's made just for the Holy Spirit to come in. And they, they put themselves in there instead. So when Jesus went on, he said, that you, should have, you should have known this from all the things that I did. They bear witness of who I am. Who else could do this but God? It's as plain and simple as that. Who else could do it? That's what he's telling them. Who else could do that? But you do not believe because you are not of my sheep 
as I said, and I can see them now. Oh my gosh, are we going to go back to the sheep? We heard enough about the sheep the last time you were in town. Now we're going to hear about the sheep again. They didn't like to hear about the sheep. They didn't like that at all because they don't like being called sheep. They don't want to be a part of the flock. And he says, but you don't, and you don't have to worry about it. He says, because you're not part of my flock because you don't listen to me. You don't hear me. But isn't it interesting, those that do listen and do hear, uh, I, I thought it was interesting this morning, Ola, and I'm, I'm going to pick on it a little bit, not pick on it, but I'm going to use you for an example, because I thought it was awesome what you said this morning, and, and I've used this many times, in, uh, talking to people, how you knew when you came in the first time and sat in the pew, you felt the peace, and you knew it was real. It wasn't a fake feeling. It wasn't, you told me, you said this morning, it was real. See, if there are those, that when you have that kind of a heart, that when God speaks to you, when God, if something happens that is not expected and it comes in, those that know who God is or understand that there is a God will recognize that it is God. But those that don't want to accept that there is a God, won't know it, they'll just say, oh, I got gas. <laughs> or something. They'll lay it to something that's really ridiculous because they don't want to acknowledge the fact that God moves in their life. God moves in everybody's life all the time. He's around us all the time. There's there. I, I love it when you go to, you go to Psalms and it, and it says, the fool is one who looks around this world and says there's no God. There is so much beauty, there's so much wonder as we look around at everything that we see, everything that has been created, and we can't copy it. Though man tries, they cannot copy it. How can you not know that there is a God? How can you say that there's not a God? That man is a fool. But verse 27 says, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I love the intimacy that comes from that. The sheep hear my voice, so we're listening. And I told you, the sheep, once they hear the voice, that they follow. That's the only one they follow. They do not change. Any other voice they hear, they run away from. That's the natural thing about a sheep. And that's why he's a likening us to a sheep. Because those of us that understand and have heard God's voice, we have been distracted sometimes when we get off the beaten path, but we know it, don't we? Because we hear God's voice calling us back. And thank God he's got that mercy that he does that for us. He says, my, boy, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. And that's exactly what we do. And he says, he goes on in verse 20, he says, and I give them eternal life. And they shall never perish, neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. There's a lot in there. I'm coming back to that. Well, look at what happened when he mentions this again. I and my Father are one. They ask if he's the Christ, tell us plain. He said, I already told you, you know that I am. And now he ends it by saying, the Father and I are one. We are one. So yes, he's the Son of God. That's what he got in trouble with before, because he said, I told him I was the Son of God. He just... So anyway, verse 31 says, then the Jews took up stones again to stone him. The immediate response, in fact, I heard, listen to one guy say, I'm quite sure that they carried the stones around just in case they ever ran across Jesus. They were just waiting to stone him. And it's amazing to me. I mean, you stop and think about it. What has he done? And he's proven it over and over. He's stated it over. What has he done that was wrong? What did he do that was bad? What are you not wanting to know and want about this man? He's done nothing wrong. But they are using their rules and regulations that they came up with and trying to say that he's wrong because he's breaking their rules. See, I say it's their rules because God gave us 10 rules. They asked for 613 more. I see it. It's a shame. And this, we see this all the time. There's more rules, more rules. Then the Jews took up stones, again the stones, and Jesus said to them, I can see him. 
Okay, here we go again. No. We've been here before. What are we going to do? And he goes, Many good works I have shown you from my Father. For which of those works do you stone me? Come on. All the good works I've done. What are you going to stone me for? Which one? Because I got that guy so he can see. That I caused that man that was lame so he could walk. Been that way for 38 years. Is that it? That was bothering you? Oh, because I, oh, I know. I must have taken money out of your pocket because I fed those 15,000 people so you guys didn't get to, to cash in on that on your own. No, what is the good works that you're, that you're stoning me for? So the Jews answered him, and I love their answer. Oh, no, it's not for a good work we do not stone you, but for blasphemy. And because you, being a man, make yourself God. Damn. But what has he just got done? I just got done saying it. The things he's done, no man could ever do. The man, even the blind man said, what man could ever have done this? It has to be God. Because no man has ever taken a blind man from birth and caused him to see. No one has. But Jesus. But I want to tell you something. I think this is a little bit more interesting. It's because you, being a man, make yourself out to be a God. If they had stopped and recognized and realized what they knew about Scripture, and they knew about the coming of Christ, and they knew that He was coming from God, they knew Scripture because Scripture said that. They taught them that. I think what is more marvelous is that rather than He being a man, you can't call your, make yourself God, he, being God, made himself man. That's the America. That God loved us so much that he emptied himself. In fact, I think I got that right here. Oh, I do. It says, let this be mine be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bond servant, servant and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. God did that. God did that. He did that for each one of you. That's what we sing about all the time. He gave himself for us. And he's telling them, I am the Christ. He's, he, he tells them. I have all this in these promises. And he goes on, he says, he just kept on telling them up here in verse 28 that those that I that I that know my voice will give be given eternal life. Isn't that what we're all looking for? I mean, raise a hand. How many people want to die? There's nobody in this room that wants to die. So he's promising eternal life for these, but they, they can't, they don't even know enough to say, well, I'll take that. The works, he says, if you don't like me, just believe the works. Well, I'm ahead of myself here because he said it down here. First of all, he said, Jesus answered him in verse 34. Is it not written in your law, I said, you are gods? And if he called them gods to whom the word of God came and the scripture cannot be broken, do you say of him whom the Father sanctified and sent into the world, you are blaspheming because I said I am the son of God? And why does he say that? And I'll tell you, I'll be perfectly honest, I looked at this and studied it and looked at it and studied it, and I'm not sure I have a complete grasp. So bear with me, and I hope that you learn something and, and maybe you can get it a little bit clearer. But it references, what, what Jesus is referencing is Psalm 82. So if you would, I'm going to read that to you. God stands in the congregation of the mighty. He judges among the gods. And the gods in that terminology, the, the, the Hebrew word for that is Elohim. Now we know Elohim is a name that we give God, correct? And yet they are given that name as well. He judges among the gods. This is God, this is God in the congregation of the mighty, the mighty being the gods. He judges the judges. How long will you judge unjustly, he tells them, and show partiality to the wicked? Defend the poor and fatherless. Do justice to the afflicted and needy. Deliver the poor and needy. Free them from the hand of the wicked. And, and, and he's talking, this whole part of that is God is 
that back in the Old Testament, God decreed that there would be judges. Most of them were men, but one of them, you know for a fact, their name was Deborah. They judged. And what their job was to do was if anything that came along, they had to do, they had jurisdiction over it. It's just like going to a judge today. They determine what the situation is, and then they decree what the penalty will be. And they, whenever they decided that was it, and the people went on their merry way. But when they were first established, they were established to be fair, to be merciful, to be kind, to do fairly and have an even set of balances. Well, you might find this hard to believe, but there are judges today that don't know that. <laughs> and it was judges back in those days that don't know that. And believe me, I believe, to my, this is my thought process, so don't hold me to it. If I'm wrong, I'm, I apologize. But I believe that the Pharisees are in the same position. They have the right to judge. They have the right to, to take care of the people. They are given the charge of leading the people to God. That's why they're Pharisees. They have been given the ability and the honor of recognizing or getting education so they can read the, the scriptures. They memorize the first five books of what we call the Old Testament. They could verbatim say them all. They could do all of this stuff. They knew the prophecies and they were supposed to lead the people to, G, to, to God. And yet what they determined was, hey, we can make a buck these guys don't know anything. They're blind. They're weak. They're defenseless. We'll just take them and fleece them, like I said last week. Fleece them. Take from them what we can get out of them and line our pockets. And it hasn't changed in the last 2,000 years since Jesus spoke about this. It still goes on today. And he goes on and says in verse uh Verse 6 of 82, it says, I, and I said, you are gods, and all of you are children of the Most High, but you shall die like men and fall like one of the princes. What he's telling them is, listen to us. You know what I'm talking about. They know that scripture. They know it inside and out. And what he's saying is, look it, you're no different than the holy people that you judge. And you're going to die just like them. And you're going to face the situation where you're going to have everlasting life in heaven or in hell. He's telling them this point blank because he loves them because it's the truth. Now, I want to go on and say that I'm not going to read it. But I think with the Gospels telling things from a different angle, John doesn't go on any farther. But I believe if you were to go into chapter 23 of Matthew, it's the whole chapter of woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, woe to you, serpents, vipers, and he goes on, he talks about them. I don't I almost would imagine that this happened at the same time he's speaking these words. Because I think it says in Matthew 23, when he got all done, they never asked him another question. So I'm thinking that that's when it took place. But again, that's just my thought process. You know, I'm great for theologians, so you take it for whatever. But this is what he's saying to them. He's talking to me. He says that they call me God, but they're having a hard time when he's actually doing the things that God has called these other people to do, show them God. He's doing exactly what they are supposed to have done, and they're not doing it. And he said, and you're having a problem with me because I say I'm the son of God? And you call that blasphemy when I'm doing what you're supposed to be doing because you're not doing what you're supposed to be doing? Do you know what would happen if all the Pharisees had done exactly what they were supposed to be doing? We wouldn't have the trouble that we're having today. No way. But they didn't do it. And, and, and Jesus told them, I, I don't understand how you can call me or black, call that blasphemy when I have proven beyond a shadow of a doubt that Scripture backs me up my works back me up. He goes on, he says, verse 37, if you do not do, if I do not do the works of my father, don't believe me. But if I do, though you do not believe me, believe the works 
that you may know and believe that the Father is in me and I in him. And I, I don't know how to take that other than if you don't want to believe me, believe the works. I don't know how you separate the two. I, I honestly have a struggle with what he was trying to say there. But I'm wondering if it was like this. Maybe, just maybe, you don't like me. But I'm trying to speak God's word. I hope that you will, if you don't like me, will turn your ear, don't turn your ears off to the word. But understand that God speaks through me for you. You know what I'm saying? It's like, like you might look at me, you don't like my hair because it's getting long. Oh well. It doesn't change the man that's on the inside. And I don't want you to get all caught up in looking at me and judging how I look on the outside like maybe they were doing with Jesus what he would judge on the outside, but judge the things that he does. And, and I think if you really want to know the truth about it, the squabbles that we find ourselves getting in in our work, in our lives, family, whatever, if we were to stop with what you actually see and realize the person that you're actually dealing with and that you know, and that you know that their intention would not have been to hurt you or to abuse you or to whatever else they might have done to you. It just something happened that way. If you looked at it that way, there would be a lot less squabbles in the world. Recognize the heart of the people. That's why God's got it all over us because he doesn't see the exterior, he sees the heart. And we got to learn to be just like him and start recognizing and seeing the heart of the person that's in front of us. I think it would stop a lot of quibbles, squabbles, and, and disagreements and that kind of thing. That's, that's again, just an aside, but I, 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 just, I just think it would. But he says, if, you do, if I do not do the works of my father, do not believe me. But if I do, though you do not believe in me, believe the works that you may know and believe that the Father is in me and I am in him. And so, therefore, they sought again to seize him, but he escaped out of their hands. Was, why is that? Because his hour had not come. In verse 40 says, he went away with, again beyond the Jordan to the place where John was baptizing at first. And there he stayed. And it had to be quite a joy to go there. And he had the next four months, three and a half months before he came back into town, whenever. And, and he was there. And he said that many came to him and said, John performed no sign, but all the things that John spoke about this man were true. And many believed in him there. That would be quite a reward for him to be out there again among people that he could minister to and they were receptive to it. So it was kind of the calm before the storm that was coming in this life. It's kind of interesting too that, I, that you see this, John performed no sign. Do you realize that John the Baptist was considered the greatest prophet? Jesus said so. Never performed one miracle. None, zero. And yet Jesus said he was the greatest prophet ever. So I think sometimes we get discouraged if we don't see miracles. John never saw a miracle. Don't get discouraged by that. Our relationship with God should not be based on miracles anyway. But John never saw a miracle. And yet he's considered the greatest prophet. But Jesus said that the least among those in heaven are greater than John. So if you've got a relationship with Jesus, understand that you're going to heaven and that you're going to be considered even greater than John. And, and I think I think that's just a, just a just, just give you a sense of peace about your in your life and who you are. But I want to go back up to verse 27, 28, and 29. 27 says, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them when they follow me. And I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. I'm going to ask Pat, would you come up and help me to this morning? I want you to come up. John, would you come up? And Matt, would you come up?
Yeah, you gotta have a mask. <laughs> so I'll, I'll, when, he, when he get up here, I'll tell you who they are because you won't be able to tell because they're all masked up. <laughs> I, want, I want you to stand right there. It, the scripture says this. I give them eternal life and they shall never perish, neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. What does that mean? Pat's going to be my guinea pig. I'm going to have him stand here. Tom. This is Pat. Pat's accepted Jesus Christ into his heart. He is now a child of the living God. He trusts him, believes in him. This is Jesus right over here. Okay? Now Jesus said, <laughs> it says in Scripture that Pat is in the hands of Jesus. Put your hands right on his shoulders. It's like that, okay? That's the relationship, okay? Now, if Jesus has his hands on you, you're in pretty good hands, aren't you? John is God. I knew we wanted this position. <laughs> so this is John. And it says in Scripture, it says that, well, I don't want to misread it, so I'll say it. My Father who has given them to me, by the way, Pat, God gave you to Jesus. Do you understand that? It says, my Father who has given them to me is greater than all. See, John's greater than all. He won't be able to get his house today. He says, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hands. So John, God, put your hands on him. Now, I want you to see this picture. Here you are, each one of you. It's right here. Here's Jesus and here's God. What do you have to fear? Not me, I'm not here. I'll be, actually, I could add on to this. Because wherever God is, wherever Jesus is, the Holy Spirit's running around. And he's just like this. Now you tell me what can come in and take us away. What can come in and cause us any harm? What can come in and defeat us? There's nothing that can beat us down. If we turn around and if we come into it in our mind and understand what the scripture is saying, that once you become a child of God, once you become a sheep in his flock, you are protected in front and behind and all the way around. And it never, ever, 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 ever changes. So you haven't got to go out in this world and have fear. You don't have to go out in this world and have anxiety. You don't have to go out in this world and be defeated by things that come along. Because they have no bearing over you. They have to get through God and Jesus and the Holy Spirit. And they don't, they can't do that. Amen. You are in complete protection in this position. And you always will remain here. This doesn't end in a day or two days or a couple of years. This is your position for eternity. <laughs> You've got to grasp this in our lives. There's so much freedom when you get to realize who you are in Jesus. His hands are on you. You're in his hands, God's hands, and the Holy Spirit surrounds you. Isn't that an awesome thing? Now my question is this. And I'm talking on camera as well as to anybody here. Anybody feel like you're not in that position? Anybody at all? What does it take to get into that position? It's a simple acceptance of the fact that Jesus said, I am the Christ, and you believe it. It says in Romans 10, I believe it is, you believe in your heart that Jesus Christ was raised from the dead, and you believe and you confess with your mouth that he is God, Lord, and he will be saved. That's what it takes. You will be saved just for that. It doesn't have any bearing on what you have done because it's what he's done. Stealing that from the song. It doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter what you are doing today. It doesn't matter anything about what your life was all about. 
He has taken every sin that you've committed prior, that you're going to commit today, that you're going to commit tomorrow. He's already bore those sins on the cross. And you don't have to be concerned about that. You need to reach out and grab him. Trust in, in Jesus Christ. He will change your life and he will give you everlasting life because he loves you that much. His works proved it. Over and over and over again, Jesus is who he says he is. He is the son of God. He died just for each one of you. And he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He sits at the right hand of God. And we have the Holy Spirit living within us today to help us until the day we go home. Hallelujah. Father God, I thank you for your word. I ask God that you would bless it to those that are listening. That, Lord God, it would change their lives. Help them to recognize where they are in you. And Father, I pray that each one that hears this will find themselves in the hands of Jesus and in the hands of God. Because when they're there, they can never be snatched away. Ever, ever, ever. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.